Hi, welcome to Go on the Run, part 2 of episode 22, Binary Encoding. In this part, we'll be looking at an introduction to protocol buffers. In part 1, we look at how to use the GUB package to encode our message instead of using JSON. And we saw that GUB, or binary encoding, was more efficient than using text encoding. However, we also saw that GUB is a Go-specific thing, which means that if we were to use it in just Go languages only, well, that's fine. But if we had to exchange messages with our colleagues who might be using another language, then it wouldn't work because GUB was specifically designed for encoding Go types. Okay, so what are protocol buffers? Well, protocol buffers give us several benefits. First of all, it's a common message exchange description. What it means is that regardless of which programming language you're going to use, you can use protocol buffers to describe the messages that you intend to use or exchange. It also does fast encoding and decoding. Protocol buffer is designed to make encoding of messages very fast. Now, why is this important? Well, maybe you're not going to be running at Google scale. And by the way, Google is the company that designed protocol buffers. And the reason they did it is because they need to exchange a lot of messages between microservices and you know their application. And they're doing billions of messages a day. And so if you can shave one byte, if you can save one byte per message, when you're exchanging that many messages, you save a billion bytes. <laughs> now, if you can save even more than one byte, well then guess what? It just means that much more data you're saving in terms of exchange. And of course, if it's fast to encode and decode the data, well, you can either do more messages or at least you can save energy on CPU cycles. And this is really important, especially on a mobile device like a cell phone, where if the CPU, the more the CPU runs, the more energy it uses. So protocol buffers are fast to encode and decode. They're space efficient. I sort of mentioned that before. Not only is it fast to encode and decode protocol buffer, but it also saves space. And that is because of the way that the messages are encoded. When we encode something with JSON or XML, every time we send a message, we'll send the field name with that message. Protocol buffer as a way of encoding that so that it doesn't send the field name each time. It sort of send like a number to represent the field name. The other thing is that it's simple to read and write. Now you might not think this is important, but if you've been around a while, you might remember things like SOAP, which was an XML way of describing like messages for interchange, but it was more for remote procedure call. But still, it was very, very difficult to read the SOAP messages was described which was described in this language called WSDL, WSDL, I believe it was, which was an XML format. Before SOAP, there was CORBA, and there was this thing called Interface Definition Language, IDL. And IDL was fairly easy to read also, but still, when you looked at it, it was it can get really complicated. And as you will see, that with proto buffers, you're gonna be able to describe pretty much most of what you wanna say about exchanging messages. And later on, when we get to gRPC, you're gonna see you're gonna be able to describe also your service, and it's gonna be simple and easy to read and write. So the final bullet point here is that with the proto buffer compiler, you can use the same simple message description and generate code for many languages. So what does this mean? Let's say, I have this simple Go type, which we have been using, so you should be familiar with it by now. And we've used GUB to encode this. Now we said that with GUB, while well, I can encode it, and we've demonstrated that we can encode it and decode it in our Go code, I'm saying that oh, whatever that binary representation that GUB generates wasn't appropriate to be used by another language. Now we could probably spend some time and figure it out, but there was no support, there's no Go package for Dart or Java or anything like that, right? And so if you work in an organization where you have colleagues who would like to exchange these client request messages with you or consume them or generate them, they wouldn't have a way to do it if your server only understand Gob messages, which is currently how we have it implemented. So 
we can take this message and represent it in protobuf. And so whatever that's going to look like when our message is represented in the protobuf format, we can then feed it to a compiler, which is called the protobuf compiler. Once we feed it to the protobuf compiler, we can ask the compiler to generate code for Go or to generate code for C++. If we also want code for Java, we can ask it to do that. We can also tell it to generate Python code or Dart code or any other language that's supported. So from this one proto file, we can have code generated for all these languages. And what does that mean? It means now that when our Go application encodes a message, it can now send it over the wire and a C++ application could consume it or vice versa. Since we have our server written in Go and it, if let's say it consumes buffer mess messages, then any one of these other languages can then encode messages and send it to our Go application. And this is very, very powerful. So here, for example, I have application one and it's written in Go. And maybe I have a second application that's written in C++. I have yet a third application written in like Dart and a fourth application maybe written in Ruby, which is one of the supported languages, by the way. And so all I need is a transport layer, which is a medium for my applications to exchange messages. And my Go application and my C++ application can exchange messages because they are using protobuffer as the way to encode and decode messages. And if I want my Dart and Ruby application to exchange messages, well, I just use protobuf and send those messages over the transport layer and those two applications would not care or know that the message is coming from Dart or from Ruby. And of course, if I have the transport layer connected, guess what? All four of these applications can send and receive protocol protobuffer messages. And because the protobuffer compiler generates the code that you need to encode and decode those messages. So that's one thing you do not have to worry about when it comes time to writing your application. Now, give you some references of all sort of thing that relates to protocol buffer. I don't want you to focus on this now, but this is what I'll present later. Um, I'll go through on the web browser and show you basically what those different links provide. But here's the link for them, um, just so you have them as reference. So if you open up your web browser and you go to developers.google.com forward slash protocol dash buffer. So when we say proto buff, we really mean protocol buffers, but you're going to see it abbreviated almost everywhere as just proto buff. Now it shows you on a website what a simple description of a, what a simple message would look like in proto buff and how you can use it from a language like say Java and then maybe from another language like C++. So here the message is, a message is encoded in Java, and then here it's consumed or read in C++. So that's an example of the interoperability. Now, how do you get started? Now, before we talk about how do you get started, now you can see what proto buffers are here. And it basically says proto buffers are Google's language neutral. And we know it's language neutral because we showed that once you've written something in protobuf, you can then generate code for all these different languages. So it's language neutral, platform neutral, and it means it can run anywhere, and it's extensible. We will talk about some of those other things as we go through writing protocol buffer um, messages. They say, for example, think of it like XML, but smaller, faster, and simpler, which are all the things that we mentioned that one of the nice things about protocol buffer messages is that every time we encode messages, we do not resend, for example, the full name, email, or ID, or whatever. And so that saves a lot of space. And, you know, it's simple to read, as you can see here. And this is protobuffer 2, actually, version 2. We're going to be using protobuffer version 3. Again, don't worry about this. I just want to show you the lay of the land. Now, the place where we will start is by going and make sure that we have the protobuffer compiler. Remember I mentioned the compiler. Once you've written your protobuffer message in a, that proto file, you're going to feed it to the compiler and ask the compiler to generate, you know, 
the data structures for you to be able to use it from Java or C++ or Go or whatever your language of choice is. So first thing I want you to do is head over to the download page. And so you click that. And if you scroll down, da, 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 da. now this is where we came from, by the way. So you can always get back there. But if you scroll down, you'll see that it tells you that oh, for most everyone else, the best place to start is on their release page. Now, these are the per buffer runtime installation. Um, so this is if, for example, you want to generate things in, you know, C++ or Java or Python or Ruby, you know, Dart, PHP, like I said, quite a number of languages and even more in the pipeline. So we're going to eventually go over here because we need this plugin to generate Go, lang Go code. But before we do that, let's just go and grab the compiler. So click on releases and scroll past all the you know messages about what bugs were fixed and what's not and then just grab proto buffer compiler you see this proto c this is what we're going to be using proto c so grab the proto c compiler for your you know brain system so i'm mac os so i grabbed the 64-bit version i don't think you should worry with 32-bit Mac is sort of moving away from that you grab that and you follow the installation installation is pretty simple just unzip and, you know, make sure that's in your path and you are good to go. Of course, if you want to be able to generate for the other languages, you might want to grab um, protobuf for all or something like that. But since I am not working with any other language other than Go, I'll go back and then scroll down. So you have the compiler install with with the compiler install, you're not going to be able to generate Go code. You still need to get the plugin for Go. So then you're going to click on this link. And this is going to take you to a package that implements with some commands the plugin for generating Go code. And so you want to grab that and it tells you how to install it. And essentially, you just want to basically do this, run this. You don't have to worry about all the other stuff. Uh, that's not that important, but essentially that's all you need to do is run this command. And that's going to give you the plugin. And the reason why is because the proto buff compiler, proto C, and it tells you that here, proto C compiler, when you ask it to generate Go code, it looks for this plugin file, um, this executable to actually generate the Go code. And so that's why you need to install this plugin. All right. So those are the two things. Once you've executed that, now you should be able to go to your command line. And what I did is in our encoding directory, I make a directory for part two. And as you can see, we had part one from before. Now this is part two and change into that directory. And I call my Visual Studio Code editor. Now, so far, all I have there is exercise one and in the exercise one directory, within the exercise one directory, I have this go.mod and binary encoding as the module we're working on. That's all that I have. Now remember, from the command line, you should be able to type the command proto C and it should be, this tells me from my ZSH shell that basically it knows about this application that I can run it, it's in my path. Okay, so make sure that's all you have that. Now notice when I run it, what it, what it shows me is how it should be called. So proto C, option and the proto files, which is the input files, which we haven't learned how to write yet, but don't worry about that. We'll get around to all of that. The thing that I want to draw your attention to is this part here, the different options for generating code. Now notice C++, C Sharp, which I didn't even mention, JavaScript, Objective C, PHP, Python, Ruby, and you don't see Go here, but Go is also supported. So you simply would say dash dash Go underscore out and a directory so let's get started now oh before we do let's go back to our web browser and so if we scroll up here um where are we okay here we go we can go back to that page where we landed on force so remember we did the download and install the protobuffer compiler you can read the overview and you can try the tutorials the tutorials are for different languages so you can go through and look at the different tutorials that you know depending on which language you're interested in. So that's one approach. 
The other thing you can do is you can look at, like I said, we're using protobuffer three. Protobuffer three is simpler than protobuffer two. So I don't think you should waste your time doing protobuffer two. Everything you'll need to do, you can do with protobuffer three, plus it's simpler. So just focus on protobuffer three. Now, this explains what a message look like, the different types of messages, nested values, blah, 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 all this stuff. This is your reference. So you should absolutely read this to understand it. What I'm going to show you in the introduction is just a snippet, a small piece of this. I'm not going to cover everything. We can't because it just take forever. Okay. So just keep that in mind. If you jump all the way down to generating your classes, it will tell you exactly how to run that command. And you can see it here. Um, to specify the different outputs. And as you could see, in the one invocation of the command, you can actually generate code for a number of languages. Now, the encoding part tells you exactly how each language encode the data. The next thing is the style guide. Now, we're not going to focus a whole lot on this, but it basically gives you some recommendation of how you should format your code or your product buffer file should be formatted and basically use snake case for the file name and so on. And it goes on and on and many tabs and so on. Right? So that is about styling, how to name your enum. They should be all uppercase, but we'll get back to that. I just wanted to let you know, like I said, I have the reference there with all these links that I'm going through. I just want to give you a quick rundown. If you want details on how the Go code, um, Go code is generated from Pro buffer specification, well, this is going to tell you all that information. Again, remember that how we got and install the plugin for Go code. And once we have that, then we can use the minus Go underscore out flag, which I haven't showed you how to use yet, but it's going to generate Go code. And this is a simple example of how to use it. In this example, we're specifying two proto buffer files to generate code from. And we're saying that we want those go the Go code to be written to this directory. Of course, this is how we let the compiler know that we want Go code. And this is a directory in which it can find more proto buffer file just in case you import. So as a go, we can import packages in Go source. We can say, for example, in this proto buffer file, we imported another proto buffer files to get more messages or other messages that are defined there. Again, don't worry, we will probably cover something like that. Okay, so that's is about that. And then it talks about more Go specific things about packages and so on, which some of those things we will cover. There are what are called proto buffer well known types. And these are types that are already defined that you can just simply reuse. For me, the one that I'm most likely to reuse is the timestamp one. All the other ones, I don't think I'll have reason to reuse them anytime soon, but it's up to you. There's a definition for all of them and how they can be used. Um, the timestamp one is really cool in that you can then include timestamp as a field in your messages. So if you have a message where you need to exchange or send a timestamp, well, then there's already a type defined that you can just reuse so you don't have to think about how a timestamp should be encoded. So that's what that is for. Um, so that's the well-known type. There's also a duration one um, that is similar to timestamp and it tells you how to use that also. So again, the code is going to be generated for you to be ab able to use timestamp and duration very easily. And there's the reference code um, that does the documentation for those well-known types. Now, when we install the proto um, gen package for Go, here's the that package documentation. And it basically tells you, you know, how that package can be used to, you know, call Go code. And so here's an example of a protocol buffer message. And when it's generated, how it's generated. Again, um, there was another page here that tells you a little bit more about how the Go code is generated. And this is just the package documentation here um, that goes into a little bit more details on how you can use it and all the different methods that it offers, like, you know, how to encode and decode messages and all these other things. We are going to play with it a little bit, but we don't, will not have need for all of these um, 
functions or method that are exposed. So, but the documentation is there. And finally, if you want to know a little bit about how or why proto buffer messages are so efficient, this explains how it gets the efficiency, how it encodes messages of a certain type and all this other stuff. If you're interested in that sort of details, well, all of that is right here for you. I don't think most of us will be interested. Like, I think this is interesting, but I really don't have the time to try and understand exactly how it's encoded because I'm not gonna go write a pro buffer encoder. But if that's your thing, that's how it's done. All right, so I think that's enough about the reference material. So let's jump into some to the introduction of protobuffer. So let's start very simple. So again, in exercise one, all I have is my Go mod file. It doesn't really have anything other than the module name. So what I like to do now is create a directory. I'll call it model. And let's create a file. And if you remember from the style guide that I quickly ran over, it says that when you create a protobuffer file, it should be snake case, as if it's multiple words. Well, for example, we'll just call this one um, demo.proto. proto. Now I've installed a plugin for protobuffer. Uh, uh, let's see, pro, pro buff. And the plugin I installed is this guy. And it just basically does a little bit of syntax um, highlighting forward my protobuffer file. The first line you're going to put in a protobuffer file is going to specify which version of protobuffer you're using. If you leave out the syntax line, the protobuffer compiler will assume that you're using protobuffer version two. So for that reason, you want to do syntax and you want to say equals to PROT or proto three. Unlike Go, protobuffer uses the, the semicolon to terminate a line is required. So we don't usually do that in Go, but you something you just have to get used to. So this is all we really need to say that we have a protobuffer version three file. Now let's do a test. So I'll open up my terminal here and just so we can get used to generating protobuffer file. Okay, so let's type the proto C compiler, PROT or proto C. We want to generate go file. So we do dash dash go underscore out. And where do we want it to generate the result? Right in this directory is fine. We, don't, we can put another path if we want, but um, keeping the generated go code next to the proto file that it comes from, I think is a good idea. It's sort of like how you keep your test file close to your go file. And those are nicely coupled because they are. So keeping them together makes sense. And so the file we want to compile is this demo.proto file. So we could specify multiple files. And again, remember, we can specify multiple outputs if we want to. So for now, we'll stick with just generating Go code. And so if I run this, you can see that the name it gives the file is demo.pb.go. This is going to always be the name that the Go plugin uses. So let's see what's in this file. So it looks like a whole lot. You now it tells you do not head it. So Make sure you don't change this file anyway. Just regenerate if you need to. But notice if we scroll down, it doesn't really have anything other that seems like some boilerplate stuff. Um, nothing really for us to use, but I wanted to show you that even with just, just that one line, something gets generated. It's not an empty file, but it's nothing for us to use. But notice here it says that proto that package um, this is using version three, and that's because we specify it here. So that's the first line, the syntax line. The next thing is, but let's look at one other thing. Let's scroll up to the top and look at the package. Our package is demo. Well, that is because our file name is demo. If we had used another file name, it would use that as the package name also. So if we want to use a package name, we can say package and we can say this is maybe um, model is our, our package name and semicolon. And let's regenerate. And if I go back and look at this, we'll see that oh, now my package is now model instead of being demo. Since I didn't specify a package name before, it just used the file name, but now it's using this package name. Now, the package name here is a good idea and not all languages have packages. And so it might depend on what the package name is. Maybe you can over, you might have to overwrite it. 
So an example of that might be that maybe this is called model that other that thing, for example. And we can certainly run that and the Goja plugin will change that package name in a certain way and we'll see it replaced with underscore, right? But we might not like this name. And so we can override, this is called a file level option. And so we can say option go package. And let's see if when I type go package, you can see it says set the go package where structs generated from this profile will be placed. If omitted, the go package will be derived from the following. Um, followed by first the base name of the package imported path. If provided, otherwise the package statement and the profile if present, otherwise the base name of the profile. So if you, this is what I was saying. If you do not specify a package here, you saw it use the file name. If you specify a package, it uses that. But now if you use this, then it would use the package that you specify here instead. So we can say that oh, we want our package to be called model. Now here I'm getting a error message. And that's why I use that plugin because it does some linting for me. And it tells me at all oh, it expected an equal sign. So I put that. And then it's still telling me at all oh, it uh, doesn't like how I've typed it. And it says that oh, it should be a string. So definitely install something like that plugin. It doesn't have to be that one, but something like it that will help you if you make a mistake. And so now if we rerun our compiler, we should see it all we're back to using model as our package because we've used this option file option to override it. Now there's some file option for Java. So you can override the Java package if you don't want the one that's defined in the proto file. But not every they're not options for every language because for some language it doesn't make sense. So there are options to override certain things for different languages. But remember languages do differ so um i think this is pretty much the only go thing that you can override in terms for for the go language java have a few more c like you can say for java not only do i want to override the package name but whether i should use multiple files or not okay so let's move on so that's pretty simple so far so one of the things that protobuffer offer you is a number of fixed types so let's go back here to protobuffer language definition and let's scroll down, scroll up because we're almost down at the bottom and we should see, there we go. So you can see we have the protobuffer types here and their corresponding type in the language with some notes. So we have double, float, in 32 in 64, in 32 in 64 signed in 32, signed in 64, and these look very similar to the types that we have in Go. We have fixed 32, fixed 64, signed fixed, signed 64. Now, what's the difference between fixed and the unfixed one? Well, it tells you here, the unfixed one are variable length encoding. So that means that how it is going to, even though you use a 64-bit value, if the actual, or a 64-bit type rather, which would normally require eight bits, if the value you're encoding can fit in a single byte or two bytes or less than eight bytes, well, it would just use that. But because protobuffer is smart enough to encode what type it is, well, even though it's using less bytes on the receiving end, it's going to create the appropriate type. But when it's sending, it's going to use less bytes. And so again, more ways to be space efficient and of course make it encoding and decoding faster because instead of having to encode eight bytes, that just carry the number one or the value one, it would just use like maybe one byte, but it would still say that, oh, this is a 64 bit value. And on the other side, so you save sending seven bytes. So all more reason why you should be using protobuffer. Now, sometime you might want the fixed size because regardless of what the value is, you always want to encode with the eight bytes or four bytes, right? And an example of that is that it says, because it might be more efficient than for larger values. Remember, we said that oh, if you're using smaller values, even though you know that oh, the um, type is, let's say, eight or four bytes, then variable length encoding might save you some size. But if you, you know that all oh, your values tend to be on the large side, then you might as well just go with fixed um, size encoding anyway. So that's the numeric types. And so, of course, you have um, Boolean, you have string, and bytes. 
Okay, so those are the scalar types. Let's just skip this. You can go through this and look at enums and so on. So let me just continue here. So let's say we want to do a message. Now, when we were looking at our application before, we had this client request message. So in Protobuf, we would say message and client request. That's it. That's our message. And right now our message is empty, but this is still a valid Protobuf file. So let's compile and see what we get. So if we run that and we go back here. And so all this stuff we've seen before. So let's just focus on this part. And so type client request struct. So far, if we ignore all of this, this looks exactly like how we would define a struct, an empty struct. Notice these XXX. Those said these are fields that we should not use. Now, if we were to write a simple application, so let's call it CMD and let's just put main.go and let's call it package main and we want to import from our binary encoding package and we want to do model okay and function main and what i like to do is have a variable call our client request maybe one colon equals okay of type model that and there it is client request structure now if i try to see what's in there well i see those fields because they're capital x and they're exported but even though you see them doesn't mean that you should use them okay now i want to say fmt that print f and client request one colon percent v and backslash new line and then let's do client request one okay simply enough give me an import of all it's being lazy import fmt oh um sorry this is wrong no one there wasn't important it so i don't want to initialize anything so I'll just create a variable all right so let's see if we can run this so i don't want a separate tab i actually want to split so there we go all right so cd go up one command uh, uh, so I created a directory. I did not create a directory called CMD. Instead, I created a file called CMD. So let me remove that file called CMD, which is empty. Let me create a directory instead called CMD and move my main into CMD. There we go. And so let's go into that CMD directory. And I say go run and let's type that. And notice you can see um, we have a structure, yes, with some types that we don't really care about. But I just wanted to show you that how this is just a regular Go structure when we generated the Go code. Now, of course, we can certainly ask for it to generate, you know, Ruby or whatever. Um, I don't have Ruby installed, I think, so I don't think I'll get Ruby to be generated. But let's try it. Da -da -da, R U B Y underscore out also in this directory. Oh, it works just fine. Uh, let's do dart while we're at it. Da -da -da. Dart out equals to that. And why not go crazy? Pythyn python equals that. That that um, JavaScript underscore out equals that. I'm not going to use all these things, but why not generate them? Um, okay, unknown flag python. Okay, so uh, I didn't like my python, but maybe PHP. PHP. Oh, all right, so I don't have the plugin and stuff for PHP. So C++, C++. Ah, yeah, I don't have all the plugin and stuff to, for C++. Oh, this is supposed to be C++ out and Python out. Uh, CPP underscore out. And then um, if I want, I can do that. that. PYTH, PYTH on Python. PYTH, Python out underscore equals that. All right, so it couldn't find um, the executable for the Dart. So, all right, I need to install that guy. Um, let's see. So there's a ton of code. So there's JavaScript. No, it doesn't matter if you know JavaScript or not. If you're a JavaScript programmer, you'd know how to include this file and use it. 
If you're a Ruby programmer, you'll also know how to include this file and use it. Similarly to if you were doing Python, you would know how to import this package and use it. Okay, so that is all I sort of want to show that out. This, from this simple file, we can generate. Um, got it, got it, um, uh, ignore. So for now, I'll leave that um, there so we can sort of mess with it a little bit. So let's go back to our protocol buffer file. I'm not gonna try to generate, recreate our client request right now. I'm just sort of playing around to show you how things are done. So let's imagine that our, instead of a client request, let's just say that we had a, not something as just vague as a client request, but we actually had like a search request, right? And for a search request, we want to send a search string. So we can simply say that we have a string and the property we want to send is the query. So something like that. Now, here's the problem. If we go over this, it was missing the field number. And so what is this missing field number that it's talking about? Well, each message field must have a unique number. And this is one of the things that give protobuffer its efficiency and speed is by now assigning a number to each field. When it goes to encode, it can just use the number to refer or even the type, um, use a number to just refer to this type that occurs in this position. And it allows also for the evolution of your message. What I mean by evolution of your, of your message, if today all your message has was string query, this one field and you call it one, no problem. You compile your code and you, you generate some um, thing with it and some code for other languages to use and they can use it and send message and exchange messages as we showed on our little diagram earlier. And if later on you come around and you go, you know what, um, I want to pass something else. So if I'm going to send a query, maybe I also want to pass some parameters, something string params equals two. And even though I have added a second parameter to my message, and let's say I regenerate only for go. So let's just go back and regenerate for go only. Uh, da, 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 da. I want to generate for only go this time. What's going to happen is only my Go file was updated to have these two parameters. My C++ and all these other guys, they're still using the one parameter that I specified earlier. So let's see. Um, it has one field called query. And there is my string now, finally. Ooh. Okay, so there it is. So my query string, okay? So in Go, notice in Go, I have my query string and parameters, right? But the important thing is that I can still send messages that are backwards compatible, which means my client that is still using my version one messages will still be able to send it to my Go application that now has two messages because since those messages from those clients will not have this params parameter, um, params field, well, it will be ignored and all of that is taken care of for me and you don't, for me, and I don't have to worry about it. Now, there's one other thing I want to cover in this before we I end it. This video is going on for a little bit long, and we'll continue with our introduction to proto buffer. So there's not all of it. So remember parameters. So when I use S, and if you look at the style guide, when the parameter ends in S, so you say that oh, this parameter is repeated. What this means is now this becomes a slice. Now again, you don't have to worry about this. In Java, it might be an array. In some other language, you'll be uh, you know whatever. But what it says is that there are multiple of these values for this parameter. And that would be the case for me if I'm using a query. I want to send multiple strings representing the parameters for that query, right? What is it that I'm searching for? And so if I regenerate now, notice what this look like in Go right now. This is just parameter, it's just a string. But if I regenerate, now you can see parameter was changed to a slice. So that's all I want to cover for today. I think this is enough. Um, we'll continue and look at nested structures enum in the next video. Okay, take care. Bye. See you in the next video.